Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to our study through the Book of Psalms. Today we've come to Psalm 119, which is both the longest out of all the Psalms and also the longest portion of the entire Bible. But don't worry, we're not going to be trying to rush our way through the entire thing because the whole Psalm is 176 verses and we'll definitely not be trying that today. We're just going to take a look at a small section of it. We're going to read from verse 145 through to 152. So if you've got your Bible there and you'd like to follow along, let's read God's word together. I call with all my heart, answer me, O Lord, and I will obey your decrees. I call out to you, save me, and I will keep your statutes. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I have put my hope in your word. My eyes stay open through the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promises. Hear my voice in accordance with your love. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your laws. Those who devise wicked schemes are near, but they are far from your law. Yet you are near, O Lord, and all your commands are true. Long ago I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. Amen. And we thank God for his word to us. I wonder, how do you feel about having to follow instructions? People seem to fall generally into one or two categories. Either you're the kind of person that actually really likes instructions. You like to know exactly what have you got to do and how are you going to get there? How many steps do you need to take? And when you've got through it all, you're more than likely going to have achieved what you set out to do. Or you might be the kind of person that's not really that worried about instructions. You're happy enough just to give it a bit of a go and say, well, sure, what could possibly go wrong? Let's just have a bit of a go. If I'm honest, I'm probably the kind of person that likes to follow instructions. I generally like to know what it is I'm meant to be doing and how we're going to get towards the end. There's one area of life that especially I like to follow instructions, and that comes to cooking. Anybody that knows me quite well knows that actually I really like my food. And so there's nothing that I would hate more than the idea of making the effort to try and cook the dinner and just completely messing it up. Because to be honest, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. So I like to follow instructions. I like to know when I've started, all the ingredients are there. And when I get to the end, my dinner is going to be there and it's going to taste really nice. doesn't matter whether I've made this particular dinner before. I still want to see the instructions and make sure I haven't forgotten anything. Food is really important to me, and because of that, I want to make sure that I get it all right. Well, if you're a Christian, then how you live for God should be the most important thing in your life. There's nothing that should come before our relationship with God. We know that there can be times when, and this probably seems quite daunting, there are times when you're maybe not too sure what it is you're meant to be doing, or you're maybe not quite sure what the right words are to speak. Well, thankfully for us, God has given us an instruction book of sorts that we can follow, and that's our Bibles. God has given us his word, and in it, we find out all sorts of things that are important, all things that we need to know about. We can learn about God, who he is. We can learn about what he's like, what he has done for us, and why we're meant to live for him now that we've been saved. As I've said, Psalm 119 is the largest section of the whole Bible, and it's been dedicated to speaking about and giving thanks for God's laws, for giving praise for God's word to us. And probably the most well-known verse of this psalm is verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. One area that I think that we can all struggle with at different times is the area of prayer. And thankfully, the Bible actually says a lot to us about prayer. And the reason for that is because God wants us to pray to him. And so he's given us whole sections of the Bible that can help us learn how to pray or learn how to pray better. And so as we spend some time in this short section of Psalm 119, I want us to think about prayer. And I want us to see a few things that we should do when we pray. Firstly, we should pray earnestly. We should pray God's word and we should pray expectantly. 
And so as we start looking at this psalm, let's see that we should pray earnestly. The first thing we notice about this psalm is that his prayer to God here is really not half-hearted at all. He doesn't think to himself, well, you know what, I'll give it a go. We'll see what happens. I mean, there's no harm in trying. He describes himself as calling out to God with all my heart. We're not given the exact details of what it is he prays, but instead, and more importantly than that, we're actually shown the object of his prayer, and that's the Lord. We see from this psalm that he isn't looking around him trying to find the solutions. He doesn't depend on himself. He's not hoping that his friends or any of his possessions can help him. But he is totally relying upon God. He knows that there is none who can compare with God. He is the sovereign Lord over all of the earth. And he alone is our refuge at all times. Because of this, the psalmist doesn't hold back. He knows that God alone can answer his prayer. And so he throws himself at God's throne of grace. And he calls out for help with all of his being. Prayer is an amazing gift that God has given to us. We know that God is high and exalted over all creation. That he alone is holy and perfect. We know that, that he doesn't really need anything from anybody. But yet he still calls us to come to him. And he wants us to bring the things that are in our hearts to him so that we will trust him and we'll look for his help and provision for everything in our lives. The psalmist was going through a time of trial and he was desperate for deliverance. And that's why he calls out in prayer. But we know life isn't always going to be like that. So we don't have to expect that if we want God to hear us, it means that we're going to have to always be up before the rising of the sun and desperately crying out to God for help. That there is times for that. But there's also times in life when it's okay to be clear and to be calm as we approach God. Large portions of our lives are actually going to be like that. But when we're in those times, it doesn't mean though that we should take this gift for granted. Because the truth of the matter is, prayer isn't something that we've merited for ourselves. It's not as if whenever I start to pray, God sits up and thinks, Oh, look, Steve's speaking. There's a good guy right there. I need to make sure I help him out with whatever it is he's looking for. All of us can only come to God because of the work of Christ. Jesus died to give us access to God. We read on Good Friday that as Jesus died on the cross, the curtain in the temple was torn open. And that symbolized that our access to God had changed. As the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 3, In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. The psalmist also tells us here why he is so earnest in his approach to God. He wants God's help so that he can obey God's decrees. When he asks God to answer him, he says that he will obey your decrees and keep your statutes. But I don't want us to think that when he says this, he's just trying to bribe God. Our psalmist here is someone who has spent time in God's word and he wants to live by it. He knows that the only way that he can possibly do this is with God's help. He knows that he can't do it for himself. And so the psalmist is actually a living example of what we read about in Luke 18. Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray and he told them a parable about the persistent widow who would not give up on her plea for justice even when it was coming from a corrupt judge. And eventually we find that she is answered because of her persistence. Jesus ends the parable by asking the disciples, And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? The answer is clearly no. Even if this corrupt judge eventually listens, how much more will God answer our prayers? And that should give us confidence, shouldn't it? That we can bring everything in our hearts to God, that we should never give up or lose hope even if we don't seem to find our answers immediately, because God will 
answer prayer. And now the second thing that we see from this passage is that we should pray God's word. I'm sure I'm not the only one that has ever struggled with a question. What should I pray? Maybe you know the kind of what it is you want to pray for, but you're worried about how you're actually going to say it. How are you going to bring it before God? Because if we're honest about it, we don't want to sound silly when we're praying, do we? Especially not if we're in a group and other people are listening. That fear kept me from praying in public for a very long time. My mind would go blank or if I'm honest, I would spend that long trying to figure out what on earth should I possibly say that the prayer meeting was at was over before I'd even got started. Well, it seems like a very simple thing to say, doesn't it? But the easiest way to build a relationship with someone is to actually speak to them. It's certainly possible for us to find out about someone else, uh, what they're like, what they're interested in by talking to other people. But the best way for you to get to know someone is to actually talk to them. Otherwise, you're only knowing about them. You're not really getting to know them themselves. Before getting married, I don't think I'd have done my relationship with Jill any good if instead of actually speaking to her, I just talked to other people that knew her. And even more so, now that we're married, it's really important for us to spend time talking to each other. For me, getting to build that relationship with Jill, to grow it stronger and more mature. And it's something I have to keep working at all the time. I'm definitely not very good at it at the moment. And if it's so important for us in our earthly relationships, then how much more should this be true for our relationship with God? Thankfully, when it comes to prayer, we can actually learn how to enrich our prayers and to give ourselves more confidence as we come and speak to God. How do we do that? Well, simply, we pray God's words. What I mean by that is that when we read our Bibles, we are hearing from God himself. And when we do this, by his Holy Spirit's help, we're able to learn more about God's will, what he's done for us, how he wants us to live. Then we allow these words that we have taken in to become part of our prayer vocabulary. And so if we're reading through the Psalms as an example, and we see the Psalmist praising God for his majesty and splendor, then we praise God for his majesty and splendor as we read about God being holy, perfect, and just, then when we speak to God, we should acknowledge these things as well. It's amazing as you read through the Bible, how many prayers you actually find, both in the Old and New Testament. We can read Hannah's prayer in 1 Samuel. There's loads of different prayers from David throughout the Old Testament. Jesus gave his disciples the Lord's Prayer and we have recorded his high priestly prayer. And we find Paul writing things down in his letters to the churches that he is praying for them. <coughs> These prayers, as we read them, will realize are a goal mine the things that we can be praying, both for ourselves and for other people. As we see how those people who have been moved by the very spirit of God, and even in Jesus' case, God himself prayed. And that's what we find our psalmist doing here in this passage. We see that his time of prayer is actually being fueled by the time that he spends in God's word. He says that he has put his trust or his hope in your word, that I may meditate on your promises, and, he pray, and that God would preserve his life according to his laws. One thing that he has learned from God, about God from his word, which is the only given confidence, is the fact that God is a covenant God. You'll notice actually in this psalm that the word Lord is written in capitals. And that's because it signifies the special name that God had gave to Moses at the burning bush, Yahweh. This was the name by which he made himself known. And it was by this name that God committed himself to his people, to save them and to preserve them. And as well as this, if you have a look at verse 149, the psalmist points to God's love. 
And the Hebrew word behind that is the word hesed. And this is actually a very rich and a deeply meaningful word. The reason for that is that it doesn't simply mean love. It certainly does that. But it actually speaks about God's covenant loyalty to his people. It points to his faithfulness, his kindness, his mercy, and God's favour towards his people. These are amazing things that we read in our Bibles. And as we come to think about them more and more in our lives, and we appreciate them more, it should lead us on to our third point here. We should pray expectantly. Our psalmist is praying here because wicked men are drawing near to him. These men were clearly a threat to him, and they were obviously people who had no concern for God's law themselves. And so we can all admit that it's understandable why the psalmist could be worried as they draw near. But in actual fact, what we find is that he has confidence in the truth that God is also near. In fact, the psalmist knows from reading his Bible and from his experience in life that God is closer to him than any enemy could possibly get. The wicked may think that they have the power to do harm to him, but they have nothing that can compare with God's word. Any power that they may have is fleeting and it will be gone like the grass. However, that is not the case for God. The psalmist says in verse 152, that long ago I learned from your statutes. This is a man who has spent years in God's word. He has been reading it, studying it and living it. And because of this, he has complete confidence in the promises of God. He is able to declare with complete certainty that all your commands are true. And that the very last words in this section say that you have established them to last forever. I hope that reading these words gives you confidence. When you start to pray, you don't have to worry about whether or not God might be there because he is always near his people. You don't have to worry about whether God maybe has changed his mind, about whether he might not be quite as interested in some things as he was when he first gave the Bible. God doesn't change. He never has and he never will. And because of that, his word remains forever. You might be a new Christian and you're still trying to figure out what this life is all about. Or maybe you're a more mature Christian who actually probably knows an awful lot more about being a Christian than I do. But the truth is that prayer is for all of us. It doesn't matter how long we've been saved. All of us can pray to God because God wants us all to come to him. He wants all of us to speak to him, to share our lives with him and to trust him at all times. We don't do it hoping that maybe we can convince God that oh, we have a really good idea that he should probably take on board and try and make happen. Instead, we pray so that we can be changed. We want to spend time in God's word, praying to him. We want his Holy Spirit to work in our lives, to make us more trusting and obedient to him, to make us more like his son. And through prayer and reading our Bible, we see our need to rely on him. And we can know that in all situations, God is completely in control. Even when we go through times of doubt, there can be times in our lives when our faith seems really small. And we can echo the prayer of the man in Luke chapter 9, whose son was demon possessed. Jesus told him that everything is possible for him who believes. And what we find is that from this response from the father is to cry out desperately, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Our very faith is a gift from God and he is able to strengthen it for us. I find it such an encouragement to know that God is working out all things for the good of those who love him. And that means whatever I bring to God, he is already working in and will work it out completely. More amazing than that, we can know Jesus' words in Matthew 6. Your father knows what you need 
before you ask him. And if that wasn't enough, when we aren't sure what exactly we should pray in any given situation, Paul tells us in Romans 8, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. How amazing it is to know that not only does God want us to talk to him, but that he, need, he knows what we need and his Holy Spirit helps us and is perfecting our prayers before the Father. We should be seeking to continually grow in our relationship with God and in our service for him. And as we do it, we can rely on God's help through his word and as we pray. And so as we finish, I don't know how your prayer life is at the moment. You may feel that you're really lacking in this area, that you really need help with it. Or maybe you're actually in a really good place. Well, I want to encourage you to press on with your relationship with God. To make the time to pray. We have so much more free time now than we did. Let's use it well to grow our relationship with God. Let us pray earnestly. Let us pray using God's word and to pray with great expectation, knowing the words of Paul in Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of prayer. We thank you that it's not something that we have come up with ourselves, but it is your gift to us that you invite us to come to you. Help us to really treasure this and to desire to do it more and more each day, to make it the foundation of all of our lives, especially our relationship with you. Help us to, to be more earnest as we pray, not to come half-hearted, but to come with with great expectation as we hear from your word and we rest in your promises. We thank you for the all that you have done for us and continue to do for us. Help us to speak to you and to hear from your word, to rely on you for all things. That's in Jesus' name I ask this. Amen.